You know, we're a city of 260,000. One percent of the city saved, that will be a church of 2,600 people. Can you imagine the cry of 2,600 people singing hallelujah? <laughs> and yet there's 99% of the city that need to know God, right? So we're excited. We, uh, we're feeling that we're literally on the precipice. Uh, you know what a precipice is? When you lean over, the only way is just a free fall. <laughs> Uh, We're about to free fall into the goodness of God to such a degree that we will have stories that we never even imagined up for ourselves. There is just stuff that God has in store for Stoke-on-Trent, and it ain't about getting you to church, it's about getting the church out into Stoke-on-Trent. You are the church. And a lot of people make a very big thing about going to church. Listen, going to church is some of the deadest places you could ever go to. They're like mortuaries. Because there's no life. Yeah, people are just going through the motions and they're doing Christian karaoke and they're listening to somebody lecture them about how to be a better person. They're even getting told that you're a sinner. Listen, if you have given your life to Christ, you are not a sinner. That is not the Bible. You are the very righteousness of Christ. You may sin. You may do things wrong, but if we are able to uh, repent, he is so faithful to forgive us. But as we journey in maturity with God, we may not actually be sinless in lifestyle, but we certainly start to sin less as we go. Because as we encounter him, we get changed to look more and more like him. That's the beauty of being together in fellowship together, worshipping together, and maturing together as well. And next week I have a word um, that I got by the swimming pool <laughs> this week. Every time I go on holiday and I sit by the pool, I come back with a word for the church. And I do feel like, I was just saying at the back, I probably need to go on holiday every three months. <laughs> I tell you what, God is about to shake up how we do church. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a foresight that we are in transition. And we've been saying for a while that the man of God syndrome is dead. God is looking for a body to rise up where everybody's empowered to do the work of ministry. And at the moment, we've been questioning lots of things about why do we do worship in a certain way? Why do we do life groups? Why are we equipping? Because if we understand the why, it will infuse us with power to actually go and do what he's called us to do. One of the things that we haven't asked why is that why do we have a guy standing up here with a message for an hour and expect it to land to over 100 people all at the same time? time is it possible that God desires to speak to you in the moment that actually we start to get words from God that are now and we all get to share it and build each other up because that's what the book of Acts was like it didn't look like this and we do this just because it's easier to do it like this but actually God desires to breathe his revelation through you through his spirit that say if somebody is ministering somebody else gets a word and they come forth and say God's given me a now word on that and they release and it starts to build us up that triggers somebody else get a revelation and they then share it and suddenly you start to see the whole house building each other up hearing the word of God and being able to release it to each other that's the type of church we're going to become So that means you have a responsibility to hear God. (laughs) Because I tell you what, passive Christianity is no Christianity at all. You have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. It shouldn't just be the few who hear God or hear a prophetic word or feel what it desires to do in a room through a word of knowledge. You all have access to the same Spirit. Therefore, there is the same demand on you to listen out to Him. And so that's the type of people that we're raising. I don't mind if 70 or 80 of you want to leave. That's up to you. Go back to the mortuary. I would rather have a church of 50 people who hear God than have 500 people who spectate. True. It's not a saying. It's not a platitude. I want the real deal or I don't want anything at all. If God doesn't show up, if people's lives aren't changed and transformed, I may as well stick in my very nicely paid job that I've just left. And so God is about to shape us up and shake us up as well. There are going to be some things that we break off as we go. We're going to learn how to do church in a new way. I'm excited about that. Do you know what that does? It takes the pressure off the few who have to come and bring a word all the time, hoping that everybody likes what's being served up. (laughs) Anyway, 
So I landed like a lead balloon on some of you. <laughs> so he's good. Children. <laughs> we're going to dedicate some children today. Uh, we were in the prayer meeting this morning, and I'm just going to have to add lib a little bit because we're, we're, we're massively smashing time this morning. Um, dedicating children is not just something we do in the church because it's just something that you do in the church. Some churches like to baptize their children. We don't do that because scripture is quite clear in Mark 16 and Acts 2 that you believe then get baptized. And a baby can't believe anything other than it's feeding time. <laughs> you know, a baby hasn't had the revelation that Jesus Lord forgiven their sins. And so therefore going into the waters of baptism, identifying with his death, when you go into the water, you go into his grave, that as you then come out, it is you being resurrected into newness of life. A baby can't do that because it doesn't have the belief, the faith that is attached to going through baptism. And so we don't baptize babies. We don't sprinkle water on the head. But what we do is we give back to God what God gave us in the first place. And irrespective of how our children come about through circumstances, whether it's a surprise or otherwise, God was never surprised. And he knew them and formed them in the mother's womb. This is not just for children. This is for you as well. You need to understand how purposeful God was in stitching you together, irrespective of the external circumstances of how you came about. Jeremiah is spoken to by the Lord and he says that I knew you and I formed you in your mother's womb. And he said, I have consecrated you. I've set you apart to be a prophet to the nation. So right in the womb, in every human being, there is a seed of eternity that Ecclesiastes says, sown in the heart of man, that when they come into truth, like water, that seed activates and it starts to produce life. That's what's happened today. The seed of eternity has heard the water of the word and it's come and activated and alive. That's what's happened today. So eternity is now. Eternity isn't something that is to come. You're already living in the ramifications and the potential of eternity all at the same time. Why? Because the God of eternity is with us. And so he speaks to Jeremiah and he says, I've consecrated, I've set you apart. The children, as they come down, they have been set apart. For what? For a mission, for a role, and for a place. That actually that he, it says in Acts 17 that he appoints our times and even the borders of where we live. You are not here by accident. Well, I might have been dragged by somebody. Yeah, but you're not here by accident. You're in exactly the right place at the right time. That you are not taking God by surprise. He's not going, blow my neck. Have you seen who's come into my house today? <laughs> Anthony's turned up. <laughs> uh, Jesus. Our children are entrustments from heaven. You know, it says in Matthew 18, it says that talking about the little ones, he, he, they're arguing about who's, what's greatness. See, it's not wrong to want to be great. It's just how we achieve greatness. You know, the disciples, they went out on a mission trip and they were seeing blind eyes open, the dead raised, demons being delivered from people. And uh, they come back with all humility, start arguing who had the greatest ministry, walking like Conor McGregor. And they go, well, I'm actually better than you. I'm greater than you because I saw that paraplegic get up and walk. Or I spoke this message and a thousand people gave their life to Christ. And they're arguing with each other and Jesus overhears them. And he doesn't tell them off or rebuke them for wanting to be great. Do you realize that greatness is something that God has sown on the inside of all of you? That actually it is a heavenly hunger to want to have greatness. But what happens in the world is that how do we become great is that we elevate ourselves above everybody else so that we can look down. That's what greatness is. Yet in the kingdom, Jesus looks at them and says, listen, I'm not saying that for you to be great is wrong, but I'm going to tell you how to be great. You become great by becoming the greatest of all servants. He turns everything upside down. And we see a similar situation where they're still talking about greatness in Matthew 18. And he brings a small child along and he talks about for greatness, we need to be humble like that child and we need to have faith like that child in order to inherit the kingdom of God. So actually, when we've got our children dancing up here, they carried something and they released something in the house. Did you feel the joy? 
when they were here. That isn't a token thing. And I said to, I said to Lauren, why did they go back? They should have stayed and just danced all morning. And actually, let's not wait next time until we've got a child dedication for the kids to be seen worshipping. How about they own the stage? Because the kingdom of God is for children. You know, Jesus was being hampered. You know, uh, or is, I don't know if that's the right word. He was being... The kids were trying to get to him. And the, the disciples who were like the, the pros, the pro-Christians... They're trying to stop the children. He says, let the little children come to me. Why? Because there is an innocence and a purity to the heart of a child that just genuinely believes that when God says something can happen, it can happen. Our children upstairs see pain leave people's bodies. They're praying for adults and seeing people get healed. We've got children having dreams and visions that when they share them, they are talking Bible verses that they've never read before. Why? Because it talked about in the new covenant that when we are in Jesus through his blood, that the spirit of God will teach the people himself. And so our children are being raised by God themselves because God is protecting his gift that he's given to us. It says in uh, Psalm 127, this might be on the screen, Matt, but it says this, Psalm 127, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. That word heritage actually means they are a possession and it also means that they're a share. So you get to share in God's possession, which is that child. So you might think, yeah, but we made that child. But actually, it was God who created that child. He just used the ingredients that you provided and he was able to cook up a bun in the oven, put in purpose and destiny and potential inside of each human being. And he says, this is my possession. Parents, I now allow you to share in what is actually my delight. So parents who don't like their children need to have an upgraded perspective that actually they don't really belong to you. They belong to him. We should make us mindful. Remember when Jesus says in Matthew 18, if any of you make one of these little ones stumble, it's better for you to have a stone around your neck and jump into the ocean. God is so protective over what he has knitted and formed in the mother's womb. He is so good. He really is. It says this, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. That's a lot of kids. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies in the gate. You might know, not recognize this, but when Abraham was promised that he would be a father of nations, this was the promise that was spoken over his descendants, that they would inhabit the gates of the enemy. So actually, when you have children, they are like warriors, or in other words, champions in your hand that we get to raise up in the things of God. And then as we invest in them, we steward the responsibility of having God's very own possession. We actually see them being postured at the enemy's gate where they have authority to release the kingdom in the earth. Do you know, parenthood isn't just about teaching your kids right and wrong. It's about training them up in the ways of truth so that they can be a weapon in God's hand. That's what it means to raise children. And where the world has gone wrong is that parents have tried to be friends with their kids rather than disciple their kids. (laughs) Listen, who cares if your kid's happy or not if they're going down a path that's going to lead to destruction? Who cares? Their happiness is temporal, but the character on the inside of them, that when he gives you his very own possession, that we get to partner with God to form them so they have character to withstand every season of life, walking with God hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. And we've made happiness the highest virtue in our families. Actually, Discipline isn't always comfortable. That's what it says in Hebrews, that discipline isn't enjoyable in the moment, but it's a mark of love that the father would discipline his children. 
And so discipline is just another word for discipleship, to train somebody up in the way. What does the uh, scripture say? Train a child up in the way that should go and it shall not depart. So we have a responsibility when we get this possession of God given to us that we train up that child to be able to go and do things for him because they belong to him. So discipleship, I've got three things for you and we're going to land. Discipleship, um, I believe, is made up of three things. And I've got an acronym for you. Everyone loves an acronym, help you remember. And the acronym is that discipleship puts wind in the sails of your children. Wind. First one is you're called to raise them in wisdom. What does it mean to raise them in wisdom? To raise them with an awareness of the mind of God and how he thinks and how he moves. That actually our job as a church and as individual families is to deposit wisdom in the heart of our children because it's going to be wisdom that anchors them in who they are. It's going to be wisdom that prospers them. It's going to be wisdom that gives them long life. It's going to be wisdom that heals, wisdom that provides. Just read the book of Proverbs, how good wisdom is. Wisdom enables you to have the mind of God and walk as though God is walking with you. Having the mind of Christ upon you that whatever you touch just seems to become blessed. Wisdom is essential. I, for wind, integrity. We're called to raise our children with integrity that they are the same behind closed doors as they are in public. And let me tell you that, it starts off with the parents first. Don't come to church acting spiritual when at home you're everything but. Because the kids see it. The kids see when there is inauthenticity. The kids are longing for an authentic faith that is modelled not just in public, but in the home where faith is resident. And there are so many people who have left church and when you talk to them, you say, why did you leave the faith? It's because they had bad examples that around them and said, well, actually, it doesn't really mean anything. It's something that you do when you get together. But actually, when it comes to it, we just default and we're like everybody else. That's not integrity. You know, the Bible says, oh, sorry, the dictionary says that integrity is about having a whole standard, being whole or undivided. What does James say about an unstable man? Oh, sorry, about a divided man? He is unstable in all their ways. That means that when we raise our children outside of integrity, we set them up to be unstable in all their ways. And then we wonder why. Divorce happens, poverty happens, sickness happens. Un instability starts to invade our worlds because integrity hasn't been a foundation that we've raised them. You know, in the Bible, integrity actually also means, there isn't actually the word integrity in the Bible, but the closest thing to it is about purity or single eye. So how do we raise our children with a single eye upon the Lord? Why? Because if the eye is single or the eye is pure, everything else will be flooded with light. So just as, an, uh, as a divided man is unstable in all his ways, a stable man who has his eyes fixed on the Lord, a child who has that single, integrous eye, actually will be flooded with the life of God in every area of their life. So that means that you can actually start speaking over your children that divorce isn't your portion. Poverty isn't your portion. Sickness isn't your portion. You don't have to die from cancer. You don't have to die from this suffering. But actually you can live a life of fulfilled purpose because your eye is fixed on Jesus and he'll take you into glory when he's ready to take you into glory. That's not a bad wind in the sails, is it? Wisdom, integrity, and I cheated on the last one. ND, nurture destiny. Nurture destiny, that when we have this child as a community together or as an individual family, that we remind our children who their heavenly father says that they actually are. That we hold on to the prophetic words and we go to war with the prophetic words. We remind the, 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 the principalities, we remind God of who he has said our children actually are. That we call those things out. And I know already that with the babies, that as they were born, parents, Parents were prophesying over their children because the very first thing they wanted those physical ears to hear was the word of God about identity. Yeah. Nurture destiny. So speak over your children. 
As a house, we speak over the children in kids' church. I say we, collectively. The, the kids' team, they're prophesying, they're speaking life and purpose over every single child that comes in. And it's an actual scene through the eyes of the Father that they see that they are His possession, that He has knitted them and He's created them for a mission and a purpose and a time and an area. And so they call those things out as though they are. And they mark them for a life of absolute fruitfulness. I think we need to be much more purposeful about our kids. So speak over them, speak to them, fan it into flame, remind them of who they are. When they start acting below their potential, remind them of who they are in Christ. You don't have to be, it's easy to find the rubbish in somebody, but you start to speak to the gold to call it to the surface. Listen, I haven't got it all perfectly right. I see my wife looking at me down here. I haven't got it all right, but when we remind ourselves that there is a responsibility to steward the possession of God, we get to speak his life over them. And then speak ahead. So if we're speaking over, we're prophesying, we're speaking to, we're fanning those words into flame. How about we speak ahead of our children where we actually war for their future? Don't leave anything to chance over your children. We cannot leave our young folks in the middle here to chance and just hope that they make it. We need to be intentional about sowing into their lives. So wind in the sails of our children. Wisdom. Integrity. Nurture destiny. That's our responsibility. You know, we're a multi-generational church. You know, long after I will pass through, Presence Church will be going from strength to strength. That we are laying a foundation for a generation that's not yet born if Jesus doesn't come back before them. We do remember that Jesus is coming back, don't we? Yeah. I think we need to preach that a bit more. <laughs> this is God's idea, multi-generational church. Abraham, Isaac... Jacob. Jesus speaks to his disciples. He disciples them. He gives them wisdom. He gives them a single focus. He nurtures their destiny and he says this, you'll do even greater things than I even did. What is it? It's an inheritance that is passed along. And I believe that there is a scripture that is over the land at the moment, which has already been prayed this morning, which is Malachi 4 verse 6. It says this about the hearts of the fathers turning to the children so that the hearts of the children can turn back to the fathers. You know, the one greatest tool of the enemy to decay society is to take fathers out of family. Anyone witnessing with that? taking fathers out of family, that there are assignments against men and there's been a feminizing of church where Jesus is some sissy, weak and mild man that actually he is a mighty warrior and he's calling the men back so they can be fathers again to a generation that's being stirred up. I have never been in a church like this where there are ferocious men who love God with a fire, not with a gentle little thing. Because I tell you what, there is a devil out there and there is an enemy and there are men being brought back into the house to be fathers to teach kids how to kick him in the teeth. Anyway, another lead balloon. <laughs> Today, what we are going to do is that we are going to embrace a new generation. Remember when it said in Matthew 18, it says that if any two of you agree that what you agree on will be established, today we're going to agree two generations together, there will be a generational blessing that's passed on. That's what we're going to do over the house today. And so we're going to stand and we're going to do a decree in a minute. And we're actually going to... Uh, covenant as a generational church and we're going to decree what we commit to as a house because you remember that saying it takes a village to raise a child Joe, it takes the house of God to raise a child now it's not the church's job to raise your children in all of your ways but it is there to fan into flame what you're already doing at home and so we're going to stand and we're going to commit 
to nurture our children in the things of God, that wisdom would be released, that there would be integrity. How much does the church need integrity nowadays? That we see men and women of God raised up who are not shaken by gold, glitter or girls or guys. That actually they are so fixed on him and they start to live out in their fulfilled purpose. Because I tell you what, he has such dreams for our children that actually they are only going to be able to run into them if we live in ours as well. That actually we are to run our race, pass on that baton. But there is going to be a crossover where we see these children who are being dedicated today and we're actually going to be doing ministry with them. How about that? Kids prophesying, kids healing, kids preaching. Didn't Israel do an amazing job this morning? Yeah. This is one I want to leave it, and then I'm going to invite the parents and the kids to come. This is, I wrote this down. This is on the aeroplane on the way back. This generation are not only to inherit, but they're also to contribute to your legacy. We cannot fulfill what God has called us to do as Presence Church and as the people of God without the other generation walking with us. They're not just there to take on once we've finished our race, but they are to contribute and walk alongside us. And so today, that's what we're going to be inviting them in. That's what we're dedicating them to. So can I invite Maria and Caden to come, Radu and Hannah, Jenna and Paisley, Josh and Julia with Elijah, Ruth and Dan with Evelyn and Walter, Mel with Ava, and then Andrew and Andy with Eleanor. Can I also have those who I've spoken to as well, Karen, Sam, Zoe, Jeff, Lily, Paul, Donna, Anthony. We're going to be praying for these folks. Can we just stand? Is that okay? So this is not a ritual. This is a spiritual transaction that's happening. There is a spiritual dynamic to all of this. Just really quietly for we don't want it too loud. Amaya. Amaya's coming as well. <laughs> I got a little soft spot for Amaya. Is she my niece? Yeah, she's my niece. Right, yeah, there you go. I didn't know what she was. I wanted to kidnap her. I didn't know. There you go. If we're able to just to move up further along for us, thank you. Could you put the declaration up on the screen? Is that good? So what we're going to do is, church, if you guys can face the church, because they're going to make commitments to you, that you're not alone in raising these children in the things of the Lord. And don't worry about the kids. It's been a long day for them. But we're going to read this together. What I would say is, please don't read this out of ritual. If you don't mean it, keep your mouth shut. Because God will hold you to account for it. It says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. But if you are a part of this house and you know that you're journeying for a generational blessing, that God would supersede anything that we could ever imagine because there is agreement in the earth between two generations, I want you to read this with me. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, I thought the batteries had gone for a second. Right, let's read this. So, we declare and commit. We will see them through the eyes of you, Heavenly Father. We will speak who they are in Christ. We will decree your revealed promises over their lives and champion them to all that you have called them into. We receive the next generation to run with us in all you have in store. We turn our hearts to these children that their hearts will be turned to us. We will be a blessed house for generations shall be in agreement for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. We decree we will be a house who speaks and lives the truth of the gospel of the kingdom. Grace and truth, forgiveness and restoration, righteousness and humility, declaration and... Are we on? Let me know when. We decree... We decree. 
healing and health, provision and prosperity, freedom and fullness, being conformed to the image of Christ in character, word and deed. Amen. Amen. Does that sound like a good promise for our children? That we get to journey with them in all of that. And so just those who are at the front, I just ask you just to stay engaged for the last few minutes. They're just going to be playing the blessing prophetically over them just nice and quietly. I've invited some people just to come and pray and bless the children. There is oil somewhere along the front, so just pass the oil along to each other. And I just want to read this prayer over you guys. So Father, we thank you for each of these beautiful children. We thank you that they are your masterpiece that you have planned them, Jesus, from long ago for good things. We thank you that these fathers and mothers will raise them in your ways. They will raise them in the training and the instruction of the Lord. We thank you the truth of Christ will reign in their hearts, their lives and their homes. We thank you these fathers and mothers will teach and counsel the wisdom of God. We thank you these fathers and mothers will raise homes of integrity to live with a single eye on the kingdom of God and righteousness. We thank you these fathers and mothers will raise champions who will run in prophetic purpose, revealing Christ and his kingdom in the earth. These children shall be possessors of the gates, walking in authority as they anchor their lives in the revelation that they are children of God, his very own possession. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to each of you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace all the days of your life. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Guys, can we start praying for them? If you get a prophetic word, start prophesying. Can we just quietly sing that song? Just as these guys are getting prayed for, can we just go through this song a couple of times? Pray over the kids as you sing.